Hey there, good morning everybody. Tuesday, June the 15th at 10.01 in the morning and we're in 2 Samuel chapter number 22. So there's a trio of twos there, isn't there? 2 Samuel 22. Anyways, uh, almost done with this book. There's today, tomorrow, and then it'll be Thursday and 2 Samuel will be in the books, as it were, and we've enjoyed learning about the life of David here for now well over a month and a half, going on two months of learning about him and his time on this earth is coming to an end. His time as the king of Israel is coming to an end. He's called the sweet psalmist of Israel. He's called the man after God's own heart. Jerusalem is known as the city of David. Jesus Christ assumed the throne of David and came through that lineage. And so David is an integral part of the history of Israel and God's plan for his people. He's not a perfect man. He's made plenty of mistakes. In fact, even in the last uh, book, I'm sorry, last chapter of this book, uh, we're going to see he makes another mistake and uh, it just is what it is. But today we're going to revel in God's goodness. Chapter 22 is 51 verses long and it is a psalm of praise. It'll sound very, very familiar to you, especially if you went through the book of Psalms with us, because this is pretty much almost word for word, not quite, Psalm number 18. If I'm not mistaken, Psalm 18 has 50 verses, 2 Samuel 22 has 51 verses, so obviously it's not exactly the same, but almost all the same. So if you did that book with us, or at least that chapter with us, this will sound very familiar. And today we're pretty much just going to read it and take it in. And maybe we'll comment here or there, but we're just going to read about the goodness of God in the life of David this morning. And then just one little takeaway, and we'll let you get about your Tuesday here. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll begin. Father, thank you for this book. And as we near its end, we've learned so much from it. We've been reminded of so much from it. And we just pray your blessing upon all of our reading and study here this morning. Help us to be reminded of your goodness. It's something that we need to be on top of regularly. We love you and we thank you and we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. 2 Samuel 22, and David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. So he's the strong foundation. He is the walls of defense and he is the escape when necessary. God provides everything for the safety of his people. Verse three, the God of my rock in him will I trust for he is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior, thou savest me from violence. This is clearly the talk of a soldier, isn't it? High tower, lifted up high above the enemies, safe and out of their way, uh, trusting in God. He's the shield, the defender. Verse four, I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid, the sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears." The cries of God's children reach the ears of God. And not only does he hear them, he responds to them. And as David went through the litany of ways that God protects him and cares about him and, and shields him from his enemies, and you look at the descriptive terminology here, the waves of death. If you've ever been in, in rough waters trying to swim and keep your head above water, uh, you can understand what he means here. The floods of ungodly men, when you're just being overcome wave after wave with relentless uh, attacks 
then you understand what he's talking about here. Verse number eight, then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared, the foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay." Several verses there, all talking about uh, natural occurrences. We read about earthquakes, the earth shook and trembled, smoke out of his nostrils, fire out of his mouth, bowed the heavens, darkness, uh, the wings of the wind, darkness in pavilions, black clouds of the sky, brightness before him, uh, thunders, lightnings, channels of the sea. David's using all of these natural occurrences, uh, natural wonders of the earth, if you will, to represent the help of God. And all of those things represent power, don't they? Thunders and lightnings and the seas and the brightness and the fire and the earthquake. It's all indicative of power and strength. And David's saying, when I needed God, when my enemies were too strong for me, I called upon the Lord, I turned to him, and he gave me that strength that I needed. Verse number 20, he brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. Now, there are Christians who push back on this biblical principle here. Uh, there are some Christians who just say, you know, God is good to us regardless of our behavior. And that's just not true. Now, we're God's children, but I'll tell you what, when my kids were obedient, they received more blessings from their mom and I than when they were disobedient. It's common sense. And here David backs that up and verifies it. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Righteousness are good works or good deeds. Now, good works and good deeds don't save us, but they do earn us rewards from the Lord. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. The cleaner that David lived, the more blessings he received. It's the law of sowing and reaping. And you cannot escape it, you cannot avoid it, and you cannot explain it away. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him and have kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore, the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to, the, to my cleanness in his eyesight. And so David is saying here that God rewards his people when they choose to follow him, obey him, do right by him, live clean and live righteously common sense, isn't it? So, hey, let's go do that today. Verse number, pardon me, 36. No, 26. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. So that we've heard Jesus teach this, haven't we? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. When we show mercy to other people, God then grants mercy to us. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, 
and with the froward thou wilt show thyself unsavory, and the afflicted people thou wilt save. But thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. And all these verses are talking about is those who do right by the Lord receive the blessing of God, and those who try to resist it. Uh, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace unto the humble. Uh, the, you know, humble yourself in the uh, sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Just walk with God humbly, honestly, righteously. You receive the blessing of God. Resist him, fight, push back. It's not going to happen. Verse 29, for thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. God will bring to light things that we need to know in order to make a move or make a decision. So when you're stuck and you don't know what to do, go go with God and say, what do I do here? Lord, show me what to do. Give me wisdom. <clears throat> bring things to my attention that I may not know now that will help me make a better decision. For by thee I have run through a troop. By my God have I leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? And just verses of praise here for God doing what it is uh, he does for those who are faithful to him. God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet. A hind is a little deer. <clears throat> and setteth me upon my high places. You know, deer and, and mountain goats and, and uh, rams, they're able to climb up into the mountains. They're able to stand on the smallest of ledges on the side of a mountain uh, because God gives them that ability. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, so that my feet did not slip. I have pursued mine enemies, and destroyed them, and turned not again until I had consumed them. And I have consumed them and wounded them, that they could not arise. Yea, they are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. They looked, but there was none to save, even unto the Lord. But he answered them not. Then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street, and did spread them abroad. Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people. Thou hast kept me to be head of the heathen, a people which I knew not shall serve me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. Strangers shall fade away, and they shall be afraid out of their close places." The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. It is God that avengeth me, and that bringeth down the people under me, and that bringeth me forth from mine enemies. Thou also hast lifted me up on high above them that rose up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man." Now, you and I, we don't have the same kind of enemies here that David's speaking of. You and I aren't soldiers in an army. We're not soldiers in battle. We're not going to head out to the front lines today with rifles or machine guns or, or rocket-propelled grenade launchers. We're not going to be doing any of that. But we do have enemies. And we have enemies that we need God to do battle on our behalf against. Those enemies are three. The world the flesh, and the devil. Make no mistake, I said we're not in a war, a literal war in combat, but we are at war. First Timothy, maybe Second Timothy, uh, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We are definitely in a war, but it's a spiritual war. Ephesians chapter 6, the weapons are, of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual. We don't have rifles, we have prayer. 
We don't have grenades. We have the Bible. And so David here, talking about defeating physical enemies, you may not have those physical enemies you have to defeat in war or battle, but you have the world, the flesh, and the devil. Satan, our great enemy, is trying to destroy us. The world is the tool that is trying to get to us, ruin our testimony, ruin our uh, walk with God, ruin our lives, and then our own flesh undermines us at every turn. And so these are the enemies that we have as Christians. Who gives us the victory over these enemies? God does. We will stomp them smaller than the dust of the earth. You know, through the power of God and the help of God, you can stomp the devil smaller than the dust of the earth. That's good news this morning, isn't it? Let's finish her up. Verse number 50. Therefore, I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. He is the tower of salvation for his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, unto David, and to his seed forevermore. And so David here praises God for 51 verses, thanking God for his goodness, his help, his strength, his deliverance. On and on we could go, right? So, now, uh, what do we take away from this? One simple takeaway. <clears throat> take time to praise God. You know, David's a king. He wrote a great number of psalms in the book of Psalms. So he's leading a kingdom. He's got, you know, six or eight or ten wives. He's got all these children. He's running from Saul. He's running from Absalom. He's trying to lead the people. He's king for over 40 years. Uh, lots to do, right? He's busy. Can we say he was busier than we are? I think we can. What did he still take time to do? Praise God. I'll tell you this, if you don't schedule time to praise God, you're probably not going to praise him. If I don't schedule something, it doesn't get done. It's just that simple. If it's on the schedule, that's what happens. If it's not, it doesn't. And so we've got to be very wise uh, to pay attention to take time to do things that are important. And praising God is very, very important. Uh, there's a little acronym that we use for prayer, A-C-T-S, like the book of Acts. A stands for adoration, C stands for confession, T stands for thanksgiving, S stands for supplication. So A is adoration, and that's praising God, praising him for who he is, for what he's done for us. C is confessing sin. T is thanksgiving, thanking God for what he does for us. And then S is supplication, asking him for the things that we need. So that A, that adoration, we need to take time for it. I hope you'll set aside some time today to get alone and just praise God for who he is. Wouldn't it be good if every one of God's people took time every day to praise God for who he is and for what he's done for us? I think it changed your day. I really do. I think it changed your life, as a matter of fact, if you get in the habit of it. All right, that's all we got for you this morning. Good chapter, sort of a revision since we did it in Psalm number 18. But man, it's full of very good stuff there. Hope it was a blessing to you. Tomorrow, same time, uh, 10 o'clock, we'll be in chapter number 23, nearly wrapping this up. 23 starts with another short psalm and then a nice description of all the mighty men of David, 37 of them in total, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it's uh, interesting to read the stories there. Got a good takeaway for you as well. Chapter 24, last chapter of the book, David makes a terrible mistake cost the people of Israel many, many lives. And then a really good story about David offering a sacrifice. And uh, I'm not going to spoil it. We'll get there when we get there. Thank you for watching. Please like, love, share the post. Let people know that we're out here. And we'll see you tomorrow morning at 10. God bless you. Have a great Tuesday.